Ladies and gentlemen, let us continue with the second lecture of the afternoon. Our next speaker is uh, Angelika Steger. Angelika Steger was born in Munich and then continued her study at uh, Stony Brook. It's a master's degree and then, uh, and then in, in Bonn, the Institute of uh, Discrete Mathematics, where he got as well the habilitation. And then she continued to various uh, German universities and, uh, and then she was a professor at the uh, Technische Universität in Munich uh, before accepting a uh, position in, uh, at the ETH in, in Zurich when she is at from 2003. And uh, she has a broad interest which were reflected already in the previous, previous lectures, I mean, I think particularly in the Maratoy lecture, she was several times mentioned, and uh, and she she served uh, she served on the on the on the scientific council of the of the money awarding Swiss institutions, but she's not serving there anymore anymore, so we cannot ask her for any money. But uh, she was selected to the to the German Academy of Science of Leopoldina. Please join me welcoming Angelika Steck. <coughs> Basically, every talk in the 
combinatoric session, so let me just go quickly over it. it we fix the number of vertices, and then for each potential edge, we choose an edge independently and random with some given probability. Now, if the probability is enough, then we just have the uniform distribution on the set of all graphs. Now, to come back to my title, let's look at a trivial task, seemingly, or trivial task. Let's say I ask you to come up with a graph where the largest stable set is equal to the largest clique, say within plus minus one. Now, you can take it as a riddle and start thinking of how to construct a graph, but in the sense of my talk, your answer should be construct a graph at random. Because we know from the results of Matula from 76 that the a random graph at edge probability a half has a clique and thus a stable set of size omega n or omega n plus 1 with high probability. So the, the size of the largest clique is fixed to one of two values. So this would answer my task. Now, the kind of results for random graphs are, usually have this flavor that if you look at some pro um, given graph, graph property, then it depends on the edge probability p whether the, graph, the random graph has this property or not. It either doesn't have it, so the probability that the GNP has this property goes to zero or it goes to one, depending whether p is smaller or larger than some threshold of Now there are, there are many, very many results, not all trivial to prove, most of them not trivial to prove, but the proofs use one key property of the definition of the definition of edge-random graphs, namely the independence of the edges. Now what we, we means my two colleagues from Oxford, Colin McDermott and Dominic Welsh, started to wonder in 2000, I think it was much earlier than the paper was actually appeared, 2003, what is the case if we move from edge rain to, say, some graph class with, 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 comes with a structural side constraint. A typical one that is heavily studied in graph theory is like planar graphs. Now, to define a random planar graph is easy. You just say, I mean, all random planar graphs on a given vertex set are equally likely, so uniform distribution, and then you, you draw one of these graphs at random and you can ask what properties does it have. Now, at that time, we felt very clumsy about this problem. Because somehow there, was no, there were no methods available how to attack it. <coughs> so with some basically trivial counting argument, we could show that the random planar graph actually does have a very surprising property. <laughs> namely, it does not have this zero-one law that we know from average ranking. So we show that the probability that the random planar graph is connected is some constant that is bounded away from zero and from one. So instead of having this phenomenon that if you let the number of vertices go to infinity, that then you go either to zero or one and we get something constant, non-trivial. But as I said, we had no real techniques. So over the following years, um, yeah, two groups tried to come up with techniques that allow to study random planar graphs or graphs with side constraints. There is the one group around Mark Noy, where you learned about yesterday, and I think Mark Noy said yesterday the quote, if you like counting, then this is the one that way you want to attack the problem. So what I want to do today is I want to say if you like randomness, then Boltzmann samplers are the way to attack it. And we will see in the very end that the, the nice thing that all sometimes happens is we learned last year that both ways are very useful. But wait some five minutes before I come to that. 
I should say the last one sounds like it's Panagiotis, my student, so um, what I will tell you now is somehow our way of trying to get a handle on random planar graphs. To get some intuition, let's say we want to look at connected planar graphs. Then we know a connected graph, it can decompose in its blocks, its two connected components. And then we'll use this and visualize it with these yellow blocks. Blocks. And we know that the blocks form some kind of tree. And I will try to make, or give you a feeling of how to make use of it. So for that we need the notion of a Boltzmann sampler, which is an algorithm that takes a parameter and it generates an element g out of some class. Now, we can, x, the parameter, does not fix the number of vertices, but it's just some parameter of the algorithm. And the feature that we need for a Boltzmann sampler is we want this fact. So we want that the probability that we return a given object is somehow um, equal to this ratio. And the important thing is the ratio depends only on the number of vertices and the generating function of the graph class G evaluated at the parameter x. So one sees that we have a uniform sampler for a given number of vertices. And we can also ex compute the expected number of vertices as a function of the parameter. Now, the basic paper for the Boltzmann sampler is by the Jean Flagellet, Lucien, and Schaeffer, who described somehow how to construct Boltzmann samplers for various class, for, uh, for various objects. I want to explain it only for how to construct connected graphs. Now, this slide may look a bit strange, but this is my single vertex that corresponds to the starting point. You start with a vertex, and then you choose some number d, Poisson distributed, and you add to this one vertex that number of blocks. And then you repeat the same thing for each new vertex that you generated, and so on. Now, we can visualize this Boltzmann sampler by saying the algorithm just needs as an input a stream of Poisson distributed random numbers and a stream of blocks distributed according to something that we still have to look at. So in that way, this is what I said, if you like, like randomness, then you should like Boltzmann samplers because we are, you are back in the independent world. You have a stream of things that are independent and distributed according to something that you can understand. Now, whether you can make use of it depends somehow on how the blocks look like. If you generate a random tree, as we saw yesterday, the blocks are easy. And they are just edges, easy to understand. Now, if you have more complicated graph class, the, the blocks are more complicated. But what we showed is that somehow, if you are given a graph class, we have a, a theorem that tells us how the blocks look like. We should look at the generating function for the blocks, evaluate it at the singularity, and check whether this, the second derivative evaluated the singularity times the singularity is bigger or smaller than one. If in the first case, we know that all blocks have at most logarithmic size, and otherwise we know how large the largest block is, it's linear, and the rest is basically small. So we can visualize it as we are in two cases, simple or complex. And in the simple case, we have blocks of logarithmic size. So if you have n vertices, we obviously have lots of them. So it should be kind of easy to understand how a random, say, outer plane or a series parallel graph looks like. For planar graph, it's much more complicated because we have this one big thing. But in any case, if we want to understand how many vertices of a given degree are there, we, the, the, the idea of the independence that comes out of the Boltzmann sampler gives us basically already the solution. The number of vertices of, different, of the given degree is basically generated by a vertex is born with a degree. And it gets a degree when we use it as the root, according to the Poisson distribution. 
So we just have to look at this convolution, and then we have the number. Of course, we should we need to understand the d, that is the degree with which it's born. And it's more complicated in the complex case because you can be born with a degree in a small component that is probably different from the degree distribution if you're born in the, in the large component. But nevertheless, we can write down the expression. And it takes some, some effort to show that actually this expectation is right and that we have channel-like concentration. But of course, as I said, we have to understand the D so the degree distribution with which you are born in a block. Now for that we have to reuse the idea of the Boltzmann sampler and say instead of using blocks, we should decompose blocks into three connected components. That's more complicated because we, you don't glue one at a vertex but you glue at an edge. So you need a more complicated machinery but the principal ideas are the same. Now, over the years, we somehow could make all this machinery into a theory. First, getting the degree sequence of dissections of serious parallel graphs. Then we had to study the degree sequence of three connected planar graphs. And out of that, we got the degree sequence of planar graphs. Now, as I said, this was our approach. Now, the um, analytic combinatorics group got over the same years in the same sequence um, approximately at always at the same time. Luckily the, the same results. <laughs> and it was kind of annoying because we couldn't decide, I mean, is counting the right way or is randomness the right way? And then it turns out that the answer was actually very nice because after we had the degree sequence of the planar graphs, we both wanted to understand the maximum degree. Um, Bruce Reed and Colin McDermott had shown in 2008 that the maximum degree is an order block, but order is not the same as knowing the constant. So we both worked on this problem, and then we accidentally met we learned that we were both working on it, and we learned that we both can do one side and had problems with the others, with the other side. And now the nice thing is we could do different things. So we could combine our forces and then really get the log, where you see that we really need both things to get a nice proof um, um, for the concentration of the maximum degree. Okay, so this was some words about random graphs. Now let me move on to extreme graph theory and counting problems. And I should maybe start by explaining why this makes sense in a, in a talk that has the name randomness in the, in the title. Because obviously extreme graph theory and counting problems are non-random. Now the motivation is that I want to go over the tools that are needed or used in order to prove results in extreme graph theory and counting problems. And we will see that they use a lot of randomness in order to get the ideas of how to come up with such a tool. OK, let's start with the um, starting point of extreme graph theory, the result of Monkle from 1907. If you want to have a look at the triangle free graph, then uh, the maximum number of edges is n squared over 4 and is given by the complete bipartite graph. Turan then, 1941, proved that the same thing ha is true for KR free graphs. You just take an R minus 1 partite graph. So now the question is what about H? And actually, the picture indicates H is actually basically the same as a clique. All that matters is the chromatic number of H. And the answer is then chromatic number minus one part I graph, except that you add some dirt within the classes, and the dirt gives rise to an extra little O1 term. So this is all well understood, and it was proved by Everstone and Everstonovitz in 1946 and 66 
various cases. But I want to talk about maybe the easiest way to prove it from nowhere, from the knowledge that we have nowadays, and that's by using some of this regularity lemma that I only want to give a flavor of. Basically, it says whenever you have a graph, deterministically, the following is true. You can partition the graph into a finite number of parts so that most of the bipod induced bipartite pairs look like a random graph. I don't want to make this uh, essentially random precise, but just use it um, in the random sense. So we can view any graph G by saying we can partition it, and most parts, the blue, the blue edges, are random indexed. Now, how can we then use the, the regularity lemma? We take the graph, we apply the regularity lemma, we come up with this partition. We clean it up, meaning we delete the edges inside the parts and some dirt. Just by that, removing just little O and squared edges. And then we can apply some tools to this cl so-called cluster graph to prove our desired property. And then that's it. So now let's see how to prove Edelstone Simonovitz. Let's assume we have a graph that has H3 and has more edges. We apply the regularity lemma in the cleaned up bush. Then if it has more edges, Turin's result tells us the cluster graph has to contain a clique on chromatic number of H many vertices. And then we use the definition of the regularity to show that this red part actually contains a copy of H. Now, let's just, let me talk a bit about this picture, the definition of regularity. It just means, that if you think of it, the red ones were dense, the density is say D, bipartite, random bipartite graphs, then you could calculate easily the number of, the expected number of copies of H. Now, the definition of regularity just says, instead of having the ex some expectation, you have it guaranteed. With, sorry? And the only thing you have to pay is some factor of 1 minus epsilon. So you have it guaranteed, and therefore you get all these nice theorems, but the, the intuition for it comes from randomness. Okay, let's move on to counting. How, can we, how many H3 graphs do we have? I mean, certainly the extremal graph gives us some number because we can take any subgraph of it. And the proof I just gave you for the Edelstone synonymous result actually gives us also an upper bound because what did we have? We said we start with the graph G, we apply the regularity number with the cleanup, and then we know that the cluster graph has no click on chromatic number of H many vertices. So we can use this approach backwards to generate all graphs G by starting const construct a partition, decide the type of the edge, insert the edges, and then only for the blue ones we have lots of choices. So we have two to the little o n squared for, for the for the upper part, and then the right number of edges for the lower part, so we have immediately an upper bound. Now, this is only an asymptotics in the exponent. For some graphs, Colaitis, Bruno, and what I could show, actually, the idea is correct. We need an chi of h minus 1, colorful graph, namely for all cliques, they showed that they can, that they should be all colorable. Now over the years then, there are lots of extensions from cliques to more general graphs, and then more importantly, we started, this was my um, PhD thesis, to move from H3, meaning weak H3, to induced H3, and to, to um, learn about how, how many such graphs are and how their structure looks like. Um, this was then later extended quite a bit by Volobash and Simonovic, but I don't want to talk about that here. 
Instead, I want to make this. Um, I think Eric didn't say it, but I'm in the computer science department. So once in a while, I should think about algorithms. Um, now, a classical problem in an algorithm is decide for a graph whether it can be colored with L types. Now, it's known since 72 that this is NP complete, so there is no algorithm. So maybe we should come up with, with the heuristics, and maybe we should test them. And a natural way to test an algorithm is look at a random graph. Now, actually, we know from, from Bill's result from 1984 that testing on a random graph is not a good idea. He proved this surprising result. If you sample from uniform distribution of all graphs, it's pretty trivial to decide whether the graph is k-colorable. Namely, you can do it without even looking at the graph. You can do it in expected constant size. Now, the explanation is that a random graph with edge probability p has lots of cliques of size k plus 1, and you will see, find them on the initial piece that you look at. So, one could ask, would it help if we say we want to have uniform distribution on all graphs without this click? And the answer is unfortunately no. It's still, yeah, not constant size, but polynomial. So, since, the, I mean, you, saw, you see here the numbers, these are all results, but since then um, it has been known in say, theoretical computer science, the testing algorithms on random instances is never a good idea. Because basically, regardless on which problem you look at, you have some phenomenon of the, like this. Random graphs are just not good test instances, unless you understand very, very well which random instance you have to choose. Okay, so some recap of what we have right now. We, have, we know for, for a given age, what this is the number of edges of an extreme large free graph, and we know what, what are, how many edge free graphs are there. Now, let's assume now the graph has chromatic number two. The beautiful results that we had disappear, because all that remains is a little O of one term, which is not very strong. And actually, this was open for almost 30 years. It's a question of Edish. Um, is it true that we have this kind of result that the number of edge free graphs is 2 to the essential um, number of edges of the extreme graph? It's not true for trees, but is it true for all bipartite edge with at least one cycle? This is still essentially open for the primitive reason that we don't know this number. And this, uh, except for a few special cases. So what I want to discuss now is the case of the complete graphs. Um, again, we only have a conjecture of how the extremal number looks like. But now, for three years now, we have a result that, that um, from Wallop and Samachi that shows us that the number of um, KST-free graphs is basically given by the conjecture value. Now, this result per se is very nice in the, in the counting extreme graph case, but maybe the nicest thing is that it gave us a new tool that allows us um, to prove many of the many conjectures that were open. So let me speak a bit about the, um, the tool. It's called the hypergraph container theorem. And I only want to give a rough flavor of it. So let's say we consider an R uniform hypergraph. And what we want is a family C that contains all independent sets. Now, getting such a family is easy. Actually, we could say the family should have size 1. We take as a container the vertex set. Then every independent set is contained in this container. But of course, all edges are also contained in the container. 
So we would violate the second condition. Every container should use only a few edges. The other extreme is we could take as a container every independent set. Then the second condition is, of course, satisfied. But we would need lots of containers. Now we can look at what happens in random graphs. This tells us that actually we can prove such a theorem easily. And it's non-trivial. We have a small set family and we can use it only a few edges. So the idea is take technical conditions, take some conditions that somehow um, capture the main, uh, main properties of a random graph, and then you can prove a deterministic statement like this. And then we can apply it for the counting in the sense we take the vertices of the hypergraph, the edges of our desired graph G, and we take as edges all copies of H and G. And then the con uh, an independent set is an H3 graph, and if you have only few independent sets, or few containers, then we can try to make use of it for the counting version. Um, but I don't want to go into this right now, but just say there are lots of corollaries out of it. One of the famous open conjectures is the strengthening of the picture that I had before. Definition of regularity means you have lots of H. This is true deterministically in the dense case. And the, the conjecture of Koyakawa, Wuchak, and Ruhr said it's also true if you take a random graph with a sufficiently high density. Now, it, it was known it can only hold um, with high probability. Now, we could show in 2007 that it's true for cliques, at least if you make P larger. But now with the container theorem at hand, it's very easy to come up with a full proof. And actually, um, the, both authors of the container theorem came up with this consequence depending on how to realize the technical conditions, you either get it for all H or for all two balanced H. <coughs> Similarly, for the two-room time question in random graphs, it was again the case, it was known for cliques and P uh, roughly the square of the desired con con conjecture value, and now with the container theorem, um, it's again known for, for all these cases. We can also use it to get, um, for the random type problems and random graphs, short proofs for um, the Rosen-Wachinsky result, or for um, make up record games in random graphs. But I don't want to go into this, but um, end this part of my talk by looking at this fixed. It seemed out of reach for the last 30 years to come up with any of these <coughs> questions for graphs H with a chromatic number that grows through them. So none of the tools that was available could give any result. Now with the container theorem at hand, you, um, we came up with a very short proof that allowed to forbid clicks of a growing order. So, um, what we could show is log, log n to the one fourth. So now we see that yeah, we can do something. And I want to just close this part by saying, yeah, of course, the log n is what we can prove. There's no reason not to believe that it shouldn't be true up to two log n. Um, we could, um, and this is all, was already done after um, we published that, um, we, can, we now know a structural result, and we could all, also try to extend it for different things in fluids. Okay, so let me, in the remaining 10 minutes, move to the third part of my talk, that's Trying to apply, to apply what we have seen from random graph theory, from the use of random graph theory, to neuroscience. And actually what I want to discuss a bit is, can we, we, combinatorics, people, give some help of something that at least me, puzzled me for a long time? 
why is our brain able to see things just once? Lots of things, and we can recall it. Who can we do that? So, I mean, three-year-olds, you can teach everything. Teach it once, they repeat it. Now, if I tell you now that the Icelandic word for, head, for horse is hestur, at least the younger pe people in the audience should, will be able to answer my question, I guess, that I will ask in 10 minutes. Okay, so, in order to come up with the model, we should learn a little bit about the brain. I mean, just a few green slides for neuroscientists know. They actually know that the brain is not what it seems. It's not a three-dimensional object, it's actually a two-dimensional object. You can fold it apart. Um, it has also been measured that if you look locally, then it looks like a random graph with edge density something like 0.1. And also between areas, we have a random graph but with a much sparser density. So what do we know about how we learn? <laughs> we learn in the, by changing the weight of a synapse, so the weight of an edge. So for the remaining 10 minutes, I will make it easier, and I will only change the weight between 0 and 1. What we also know for some 30 years, that information in the brain is probably not stored just in one neuron, but um, a collection of neurons, say some 500, are needed together. So in my talk, I will just use this visualization. Um, I have a group of neurons, and the green ones as a set encode some information. So, so now we have the abstract thing. We have two groups of neurons, and a subset in both sides encodes a word. And our problem is we, uh, we, are, we get the pairs once, and we should do something with the um, bipartite graph in between. So that once we have done that, if we are then get just one word, then we can recall the other. So what is recall? We, I mean, it just means if we are given green words, active vertices on the left hand side, I look at which one has at least k neighbors into the green vertices and they turn also green, active. Now with this, it just means if I turn green, active the vertices corresponding to a hester, then I should activate those that correspond to a horse, but not those that correspond to cat or, or dog or bird. Now, what can we do? I mean, in the brain, we can do basically nothing. We can only change the weight of the edge. So if we see a pair left and right, all that we can do is strengthen some edges, turn from 0 to 1, or weaken some edges, turn from 1 to 0. And we can do this, say, between the pair that we want to learn, we strengthen the probability p, and otherwise we, we weaken the probability q. And yeah, maybe I should have mentioned that. We should choose Q in such a way that the density of strong edges remains the same, because otherwise, instead of learning, we would probably end up with an uh, epilepsic seizure. So the number of strong edges should be bounded. Now, with this at hand, we clearly have the problem that if you learn something new, we destroy the old, old thing. So the interesting question is, how many patterns can we learn? Now, we can do some analysis, but I'm running out of time. But this is straightforward random graph theory. We can study the degree distribution for a vertex into the set from inside and outside the pattern. And what we want is the threshold, sorry, the threshold so that um, you can uh, the, put the threshold k so that both distributions are set apart. If we do the analysis, we see that actually something very surprising happens. We can learn quadratically many patterns, which is not clear a priori. 
And actually, what I've told you is something that was known in a different context in a, for, um, for pattern instead of relation learning from Amit and Fuzi. But then also, there was a paper in Nature and Neuroscience that says, no, it's not going to work. And it's not going to work is easy to explain in the sense it's not going to work because it's theory and not practice. We don't run around with big heads like that. Constants don't work out. So the question is, what can we do? Now, answer? Thank you very much. So the question is, would you have also remembered these two strange words? And hopefully you say no. And this is what I want to use, that actually we learn things that between, we learn relations between things that we know. So we have back actually a random graph on the other side. Now I want to make use of it by saying, okay, I don't have to activate the vertex directly, but only indirectly, so I need a total degree of k. I can use percolation inside the random graph, which is percolation, bootstrap percolation of a random graph, which is understood. So we just have to carry it over to our setting. And if we do the analysis, we see that we can move these two distributions much closer. And the disappointing thing for, for a mathematician is nothing new. Asymptotics remains the same. But for the application to understand our brain, big things happen because the constants move into a range that correspond to what we have in our head. Now, um, over the last year, we tried to use this idea of bootstrap percolation to explain different phenomena in the brain. And basically, this is the, the paper for the background from biology that I want to explain. Namely, what is known is that in the brain, there is something that's called input normalization. So regardless with what size of the starting set for the bootstrap percolation you start with, you end up with a certain size, not everything, but a certain fraction of the region where you look at. So what we wanted is to have a model that explains it. So we, of course, need some two different kind of vertices, excitatory and inhibitory. And then we was, were hoping that we could explain such a phenomenon. At first thing we couldn't, because we made the typical mistake that people do in neuroscience and leave out the randomness. So we wanted a clean, nice model where activation proceeds and grounds, and then we could just show it doesn't work. Then we had the idea of adding some asynchronous randomness, transmission delay, and then we really get um, the, the picture that I had in the previous slide that is measured in biology. And then um, this is percolation in the classical mathematical sense, a one-time percolation. But of course our brain is not at one step in time, but you have a process. So we, sh we should see how the bootstrap percolation works over time. And we also see that this, in this asynchronous mode, it does work exactly as we as the neuroscientists measure. So I hope I gave you some flavor of different aspects of randomness within combinatorics and within applications in neuroscience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Enrica. Questions? Comments? As I like to say, could try examples?